folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchman video broadcast. Last week we were we left off talking about talking about drugs, talking about marijuana, Mary Jane, pot, talking about um, Lucy in the sky with diamonds and um, reefer madness and all of these things that are going on. The drug situation. Can you stop and think about the amount of power? And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with principalities and powers, part of the fourth kingdom, powers. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers. Think of the amount of power that drugs have not only over an individual, but over uh, culture, over politics, over banking. Over the, and if you think that legalizing uh, marijuana in Washington and Colorado was, Colorado was just simply for the people to enjoy their leisurely activities on the weekend. You're crazy. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And now we've taken something that used to be illegal in those two states, and now we've made it, but we're not, we just didn't make it legal. We made it profitable as far as the government is concerned because now they're going to tax it. And that's what's got, you can see it. It's going to envelop our, here in Illinois, Rich is right over there from here, okay, right across the Mississippi River. They're wanting to legalize marijuana. They already have it for medicinal purposes only, right? Legalize marijuana. They want to criminalize, criminalize soft drinks. They want to put a tax on soft drinks. And they, they want to tax them because we just want people to be more aware of the health issues concerning this. And this is actually going to save the state of Illinois millions of dollars in health care costs because people will drink less. Are you kidding me? The government doesn't tax anything and then wants you to use less of it. They want to tax it because they want you to, they want you to smoke cigarettes. They want you to guzzle down gasoline in your cars. Why? They tax it. The more you burn in gasoline, the more money they get. The more sodas you drink, the more money they get. The more cigarettes you smoke, the more money they get. Now the more marijuana that's made legal around this country, the more money the federal and the state level governments are going to get. This is partly about money, not totally. Because we're, and we, we started looking into this last week. When we start dealing with drugs, um, cannabis, uh, LSD, uh, heroin, um, methamphetamine, when we start dealing with these drugs, ecstasy, cocaine, we are dealing with things that hold power over people. And it's just like what the Bible says about hell. She's never satisfied. She hath enlarged herself. And once a person, and I've had many of you, write to me since last week's Watchman broadcast saying, Pastor Mike, thank you for doing this. This is what held me in its grip until Christ broke me free from the chains of bondage. And you know not only the kind of physical power that it held on you, but you also know the spiritual power that was overwhelming you as well. But there's always a couple that would write in and say, yeah, yeah, you're knocking pot, and you do this, and you do that. Pot's good, man, because, like, God gave it to us for, you know, stuff and stuff. Yeah, they make rope out of it. Uh, does it have, uh, let me say this. Does it have certain medical benefits? Not a doctor. I don't know that for sure. I wouldn't doubt it if I had the right kind of facts. I probably wouldn't doubt it leaves and herbs and things that we pull from this planet that God gave us have certain medical benefits in a very tightly arranged, neatly confined container. It's just like when Paul told Timothy to use a little, little tiny bit, a little wine for thy stomach's sake, not like a whole gallon of it. Hey, Paul, hey P, uh, Timothy, have some wine. It'll make you feel good. That's not what he told him. Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. The book of Proverbs talking about give strong drink to one who is about ready to perish. We give people, cancer patients who are dying, we give them large amounts of morphine. Why? Put them out of their mind. Put them out of their misery. The Bible prescribes that. Strong drink for him who is about ready to perish. And so, yeah, I get it. But to, it, that's like justifying the large-scale sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages in this country because every now and then it helps with a cough. It's like justifying the amount of drugs that are taken into the American system 
to justify its limited use for some medicinal good. I grant you it probably does. Some of you take various kinds of pain relievers. Some of those are, um, are based upon poppy seeds and oh, they're called opiates. Okay? You take them for the relief, the temporary relief of pain. I get it. I understand it. I've done it before. Okay? No big deal. But we cannot justify the overwhelming spirit and power that drugs have over the human mind, um, humanity itself, politics, banking, businesses. It's in our, 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 our lifestyles, our music. Think about that. We started talking about Jeremy Narby's The Cosmic Serpent. I read this book several years ago, and uh, basically, and I was just coming to th kind of thumbing through it here before the broadcast came on, and he does an excellent study on all the, the shamans, all the witch doctors, all of the quote-unquote medicine men around the world. He said they all, when they went into their trances, they all saw serpents, every one of them. They all had this idea of serpents twined together. And he said, it just looks like to me that they were seeing DNA. And that was the purpose of him writing this book. Uh, he calls it DNA and the Origins of Knowledge. And he basically said there was two ways that these shamans or these magi or these magicians, or these witch doctors, or whoever it was, there was two ways that they would get their mind into a state where they could hear from the spirits. I'm going to show you something that's going to, it's going to blow your mind bigger than drugs. I found it between last week and this week. Uh, he said there's, there's a couple ways they do this. Number one, they learn how to meditate. Now, we've dealt with that before. I might, I'm going to cover some of that again as we move through this, uh, through this uh, presentation on drugs. A lot of times they'll do meditation. They will bring their mind down to a certain state called an alpha state. And then in some cases deeper than that. And they hear from these visitors, these spirits, these beasts, as it were. And these beasts are communicating thoughts and ideas and giving them visions. And a lot of times they'll see snakes doing this. Looks like DNA. But he said, you know, sometimes meditation, that's not fast enough. So they'll take drugs, ayahuasca and tobacco and other sort forms of hallucinogenic. The word we learned last week was entheogens, entheogenic drugs. Drugs that when you took them, it made you look, and that's what the word entheogen means, in meaning inside of you, E-N-N, -N, theo, God, Jen, looking for the God that is on the inside of you. He's down in there. He's trapped. And in your normal state of consciousness, he can't get out. Let me show you what that looks like from the Bible. I have my Bible. Just happen to have it open to Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded. See that number 5? Remember Lucifer in Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose what looks like a Cheech and Chong movie. A smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Sounds like a Van Halen concert, doesn't it? Then... And there, watch this, in verse 3, you think about the language of this book. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the rock group scorpions of the earth have power. Think about the connection. Music, the rock group scorpions, a rock group called poison. All right? Then we move on down. Because now that this pit is opened, there are these devils here. And then there is, in verse 11, Revelation 9, 11. I did a video on that. And they had a king. It's called the uh, Revelation 9, 11 or something like that. Anyway, you'll find it. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Anybody who takes drugs, once you get into it, you don't control them. 
They control you. They have power over you. They dominate you. They lord over you. They dictate how you act. Your marriage, your marriage, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your friends and family, your relationship, uh, your ability to work on the job, your ability to do things in and out of traffic. Every aspect of your life becomes centered around serving the angel of the bottomless pit. Bottomless because it's never satisfied. And every aspect of your life centers around opening that doorway again, opening up, opening up. The, the, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in, in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. You know what they'll mean? You know what they mean? Destroyer. Ask yourself the question: Do drugs build, or do they destroy? Those of you who have come out of that, you know the answer to that. Those of you who are still in it and wanting to justify and don't like what I said because you want to justify it, you're going to have to lie about it. But the truth of it is drugs destroy lives. We were learning about the cosmic serpent. We were learning about Jeremy Narby's, not only his research into the medicine men who were taking large amounts of uh, a tobacco liquor or ayahuasca, these entheogens, these are new words I've had to learn. Um, not only his research into the medicine men that were doing it, but he himself actually participated in these experiments. And he said, I saw them. I saw the, the serpents twined around one another. This is what he described uh, in his book, page 24, one of the men he was working with, he said, I often ask Carlos to explain the origin of place names to me. He would invariably reply that nature itself had communicated to them, or them to the ayahuasqueros, tabaqueros, in their hallucinations. That is how nature talks, because in nature there is God, and God talks to us in our visions. When an ayahuasquero drinks his plant brew, the spirits present themselves to him and explain everything. Then he says, listen to this. According to the shamans of the entire world, one establishes communication with spirits via music. For the ayahuasqueros, it is almost inconceivable to enter the world of spirits and remain silent. Angelica Gebhardt Sayer discusses the visual music projected by the spirits in front of the shaman's eyes. It is made up of three-dimensional images that coalesce into sound and that the shaman imitates by emitting corresponding melodies. Page 68. And so basically what he's saying is, is what we Americans have known for years. Drugs and rock and roll. Think about this. I remember reading this several years ago. Lady Gaga. All oh, that wonderful woman who appears with the Muppets in the Christmas special. You know, she's all for kids. Lady Gaga admitted, and it's like coming out. It's like no big deal. Yeah, I smoke marijuana when I write songs. It helps me write my songs. She admits to it. Why? Because drugs and rock and roll mixed together. And if you examine, and, and, and we did, if you examine the words of the old rugged cross versus the words of, um, I don't know, da, 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 whatever that song is, if you examine the words, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? You have no idea. She knows it because there was something that she couldn't write the song while she was just in a normal manner. Just, I don't know, something blocking it. Some door was closed and by smoking marijuana that opened a door of reality to her that enabled her to write down the lyrics to a lot of her songs that she wrote. That's what, it doesn't matter what rock and roll artist, doesn't matter what rock and roll song writer you talk to, most of the songs in rock music and I would say probably even some quote-unquote Christian music written under the influence of a spirit, whether they got in touch with that spirit by way of drugs or they got in touch with that spirit by way of meditation. The outcome was exactly the same. I, I saw th this is on a news article this week and there is no way in the world I'm going to show you the rest of not only this picture but the rest of the pictures. But Billy Ray Cyrus's lovely daughter, Miley, you know, Hannah Montana, this child star that all these girls followed. Now, and if there was 
ever a mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It was, is Miley Cyrus. Anyway, she appears on stage recently with her marijuana dress. They go hand in hand. This goes, all the, this goes all the way back to the 50s, even to the 40s, into the 30s. People were taking drugs and writing songs. The Beatles got into it. Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds. L-S-D. I'm going to show you the lyrics of a song the, that uh, I think John Lennon wrote. You're going to see what I'm talking about because you're going to look at it and go, I have no idea what that means. It's because you're not high. If you're high, you go, That's, that is like deep, man. Oh, that is, oh, that is so cool. Anyway, we mention Francis Crick, who was one of the scientists, him and Watson, uh, an American scientist, working on what DNA looked like. How was it made up? What did it uh, consist of? What did it, since we can't see it in the microscope, we have to use all of our calculations and our theories, and it's very, very advanced. And so... Crick, basically, he, he related the idea that this formula for DNA was so profound and it was so complicated that normally his mind just wasn't, it was closed. It was like there was doors closed and he couldn't properly think about what this invisible thing called DNA looked like. So, he admitted a few years ago Here's the story. Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winning father of modern genetics, was under the influence of LSD when he first deduced the double helix structure of DNA nearly 50 years ago. Yes, that's right. Francis Crick, because at the time when he was working on this, he was working on this around the time of uh, Aldous Huxley, Francis Crick was a friend and a follower of Aldous Huxley. Who's Aldous Huxley? If you've ever heard of A Brave New World, if you've ever heard of Utopia, that's Aldous Huxley. He wrote of a time in the future where mankind had, had come into a perfected state. And when people got a little tired, when they were weary, when they were feeling down, then something, they could do something and it just pep them right up. They would take so many and all of a sudden, oh wow, we're fine now. Sounds like uh, the American housewife on methamphetamine. But anyway, Crick and, and Huxley, were, they knew of each other. Crick was following Huxley. Aldous Huxley admitted, let me pull this up here, Aldous Huxley admitted that he had taken drugs just for the experience. And so Crick took small amounts of LSD, this hallucinogenic drug, so that in his wording and in his mind, because there were doors that were closed, just like in Revelation 9, there were doors that were closed in his mind, and he wanted those doors open so that he could see into the world of the invisible. And he literally came downstairs one day, and, he, and he, let me go back to this graphic here. He grabbed his wife, who was an artist, and he said, honey, draw this out exactly the way I tell it to you. And that right there, you see it, is the first drawing, the first sketch of what DNA looks like. And there we see our twisted, curling serpents. And as I mentioned a while ago, Crick got the idea from this, from Aldous Huxley, who wrote a book called The Doors of Perception. In this book, The Doors of Perception, he theorized that the human brain has doors built in that keep a person from perceiving realities around him or from experiencing religious ecstasies. Drugs such as mescaline, cannabis, and LSD would open those doors. Now, let me stop right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you from the Bible what those doors are, and those doors are good. Those things that these experimenters, way back in the 40s and 50s, would they perceive that there were doors? Huxley perceived it. Crick bought into it. Um, Timothy Leary, all of these others... They thought, well, you know, we got doors closed. Let's open the doors. They found out that LSD opened the door. The thing is, this Bible warns us that when we open that door, there's, it's kind of like Pandora's box. Pandora's box is basically a very corrupted telling of what happened in Genesis chapter 3 when Eve ate of the fruit 
And what happened? Now her eyes are open. That is exactly what people who take these drugs will say, oh, now I've got my eyes open. Oh, now I can see things that I couldn't see before. You see the connection? And so they believed that there was these doors in your mind that needed to be open, and they wanted to find out a way to open them. And, and Huxley and Crick found out that if you take LSD, you can open those doors. And so it was Huxley's idea, uh, his book, The Doors of Perception, that in itself, this idea of the doors of perception, there was a guy by the name of Jim Morrison. You know who that was? Rock and roll singer, part of the 27 Club. He's one of these rock and roll singers who died at 27. Kurt Go Cobain and several others, there's a whole list of them, um, that died when they were 27 years old. Jim Morrison died of drug overdose. Janis Joplin, drug overdose. Um, the guy that played the guitar, I can't remember any, any, his name, but anyway, they all died of drug overdoses. Jim Morrison got his name for his rock group from Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception. And a ask yourself the question. Now, from like 1967, 68 to the early to mid 70s, there was an explosion of what they called acid rock. Why'd they call it acid rock? Because it burned when you burn your ears? No, they called it acid rock because when you took LSD, which was acidic, when you took LSD, you wrote the lyrics to these songs and you did guitar riffs that sounded better when you were high or when you were under a hallucinogenic than they did just normal. That's why normal straight people go on, I can't listen to that. And high people are going, wow, that is so cool. Um, who was it to figure this out? And in 2001, the Space Odyssey. You remember the scene where um, uh, Bowman is in the spaceship and he's traveling through the portal or whatever and all of this stuff is going to... They actually marketed this movie to young people who were taking drugs and touted it as the ultimate trip. And, and there was people flocking to theaters watching um, Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey and when that scene comes up, they're just going... Oh, wow, that's tripping, dude. And 2001 A Space Odyssey, I've seen the movie. I've watched it probably half a dozen times, and I'm still trying to figure out what everything was. But people that were high, they got it. They understood it. It's about evolution. We'll get into that a little bit later on. But the influence that these, this, uh, this initial idea, Huxley says, we've got to have the doors open. Fr Crick says, I opened the door. Guess what I saw? Two serpents twined together. Looks like DNA. And so he gets a Nobel Peace Prize for it. So now all these groups coming out, the doors. By the way, Jim Morrison referred to himself and others referred to him as the Lizard King. What's a lizard? It's a serpent. It's a dragon. They even have an album, The Celebration of the Lizard. But there's no doubt, no doubting the idea, this is what Narby was trying to uh, put forth, was that there was a relationship between what we're finding out as far as the basic things of the universe, like DNA, um, quantum physics, what's going on. We covered that in the last few Watchmen broadcasts, quantum physics, what's going on with CERN. Definitely, definitely witchcraft related, things of the nature of rock and roll witchcraft related, and, we're, and, and Narby and others are learning that what the, what the shamans, what the medicine men, what the witch doctors uh, knew thousands of years ago by experimenting with these entheogen drugs, scientists are finding out now that they knew something that man, most mankind did not know. Now, let me show you, let me show you a book. This is a book uh, by uh, Joan Bell, The Benefits of Marijuana, because we're, we're primarily dealing with marijuana, because marijuana is, and I've had several people write in, call in this last week and say, Pastor, you were right, marijuana was the gateway drug for me. I started out drinking a little liquor because my dad or my mom had it home. Then with the neighbor kids, started smoking a little pot. I mentioned you last week, kid down the road from me, his parents, his parents 
his parents were growing marijuana, using it regularly, growing their own, so they didn't have to buy it, okay? Had a little place down in the basement of their house where they took very good care of these plants. But anyway, legalization of this seemingly harmless drug called marijuana, now legal for recreational use. Just to, you want something to party with? Go to the store. Hey, honey, go to the store and get me a bag of pot, please. Get me a dime bag, please. Okay. So, yeah, I know some of the lingo. But anyway, recreational use in Colorado, Washington State, medicinal use in other states, they're moving in. The danger, if, and the thing is, if you don't ever start doing this stuff, you will never have to worry about it. But the whole goal, it's just like the sodomites moving in everywhere. Here we are, here we are with sodomy being legalized, sodomite weddings being legalized, and drugs being legalized all at once. Actively being promoted by the American government. Being promoted and pushed on people. Being pushed at the Olympics. Being pushed in advertising. We're being forced and led like sheep to the slaughter into these corrals surrounded by evil people, surrounded by drug-crazed people, drug-influenced people, thus spiritually influenced people. Notice what is written in this book about marijuana and what it does to your mind. When the system is hyper-aroused, as in today's lifestyle, marijuana calms. The significance of this fact cannot be ignored. It explains the increased creativity reported as, a, as part of the marijuana experience because when both sides of the brain processes are heightened, both types of brain activity are greater. The left brain notices more while the right brain receives more. This is the unification of logic and intuition. I'm going to explain what all this means in a minute. The term expansion of consciousness is explained physiologically as, quote, a shifting of brain emphasis from one-sidedness to balance, which fits precisely with the feeling called high. Marijuana ingestion has been shown to change the worried state by producing alpha waves experienced as well-being. Now, for those of you who study the scripture and you don't know what it's like to be stoned on pot or any other drug. Maybe you've been drunk before, whatever, okay? Let me show you, you get what she's explaining. The idea of balance is practically in every one of these. I know it's in this one, quantum spirituality, the Aquarian conspiracy, morals and dogma. Morals and dogma is all about balance. It's the square and the compass balanced together, the yin and the yang, and that's basically what you have, the two sides of your brain. The left, I'm going to explain this in more detail. The left side of your brain deals with logic. The right side of your brain deals with um, intuition, feelings, and all kinds of, anything that's illogical and free-ranging, that's this side of the brain. And for the most part, this side of my brain, the logic side of my brain, is what's in the lead. Marijuana takes that and makes it simmer down a little bit. And then it raises up the other side of the brain and brings them up so now they are equal. Think of um, sons of God, daughters of men. Think of Daniel 2, this is what we're dealing with, fourth kingdom. They shall mingle them, iron, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, clay. Iron is what is hard, it's... Um, it's static, it doesn't move, it doesn't change. That's this side of your brain. It only sees yes and no, right and wrong, left and right, light and darkness. That's all it sees. It understands zeros and ones like a computer. Okay? But then clay can be changed. That's what man is. It can, can be changed. It can be moved around. It can be take on many different for whatever you feel like. You can you're the mighty creator. And so iron mixed with clay is basically what this is saying. The, the left hemisphere of the brain becoming equal with the right hemisphere of the brain. So they can come together like what the Beatles sang about. Okay, you follow me so far? Now watch this. The last thing she said was marijuana ingestion has been shown 
to change the worried state by producing alpha waves experienced as well-being. Let me give you, a, I, I covered this a little bit better in a video we did called The Mystery of Contemplative Prayer. And I talk about the danger of a lot of this meditation that's going around, whether it's, whether it's new age meditation, um, you know, in the, in the new age movement, or it's done in the church with, um, with the contemplative prayer, whispering prayer, the Jesus prayer, repeating mantras over and over, the music, the music and the worship. A lot of these church services, if you'll notice, the music is designed to function in a certain way. Number one, as people are coming in, here you have that, let's get up and go music. Boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Everybody stand up, wave, clap your hands, and all this stuff. Before the music is over, and as the minister is about ready to just walk right up and start talking, they bring that music down. Now everybody's swaying. We're going to slow the mind down so that the waves of activity of, of your brain is not doing a whole lot. Okay, you follow that? That's what, they, that's what they do with their music. I'm going to bring it down now. Just like a hypnotist, really soft and quiet. Now the guy's going to come out and start talking to you. But he's not going to be reading from the Bible, is he? That's what's going on. Let's take a look at it, all right? Beta state is awake, normally alert, and conscious. That is the state that you and I are in right now. We're thinking, we're Making, you're taking in what I'm telling you, but also at the same time, the, this side of your brain is kind of help drawing a picture of what it is I'm describing. As I was talking about these church services, I was explaining the cold hard facts, but this part of your brain was drawing a picture in your mind of what that looks like. They do, are, they are supposed, this is supposed to help this. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. This is supposed to help this side of our brain make these decisions. This is never to be equal or to be in charge of this. It's not supposed to be that way. That's what drugs do. Drugs make them equal. So then you get down to the alpha state. Relaxed, calm, not thinking. Did you see that? Yoga. Yoga induces, see you can do it in a meditation form. Yoga brings the mind down and they say, they say this, now clear your mind of all thoughts and just focus on your breathing. Focus on this inner light inside of you. Focus on that and just forget about anything else in the world. I've seen, I've seen these witches and sorcerers on Trinity Broadcasting Network do that same kind of witchcraft magic to people. Okay, now, come on, God's going to heal you, but there's too much in the way, too much junk. You got, let's empty your mind now. Let's get everything out of your mind. Now, focus on the light of Jesus right there. See that they're playing tricks with you. They're trying to get your brain down to an alpha state. And I'm going to show you how dangerous that is. Hypnotism kicks in right around the alpha to theta state. Theta state is deep relaxation and meditation, mental imagery. Because once they, once they can get you to alpha, once they can get you to stop thinking, then once they can, watch this, once they can clear all of the words out of your mind so that the word is not there anymore, then they can just bring you down to theta. And then, of course, delta is like when we were really, really, really deeply asleep. Now I'm going to show you, so I found this between last week and this week, and it just, my jaw dropped open. An admittance by someone who actively gets in touch with guides, spirit guides, aliens. The Bible calls them familiar spirits, devils, evil angels, all right? Someone who actively gets in, gets in touch with these. I want you to look at what she said. She said, the alpha state, why, it is, I, why is it essential to psychic development. And she goes in to describe exactly what I described for you here. So here is what she's, here is her chart of the brain waves. Take a look at the brain wave states that occur with certain activities. Beta is fully conscious, awake. The conscious mind is busy, concentrating, and engaged in this state. Now let me stop right here. There is a difference between biblical meditation 
and occult meditation. Biblical med meditation is in Philippians. He said, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, and there's eight things there. If anything be of good report, think on these things. Meditate in Bible terminology means to think and ponder the scripture verses logically and analytically and um, well, critically, as it were, using the criticism to yourself, saying, I need to come in to line with what I see here in the scripture. You know, I just opened my Bible here. Belo oh, 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of, uh, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Biblical meditation says, think on these things. Ponder them. Meditate on them. Newage meditation says, don't think on anything. Well, can I think about Jesus in John 3.16? No. You can repeat John 3.16 over and over and over and over and over again, but you can't think about what it means. And I see this junk moving into the church and people are, are taking p pieces of these New Age Bibles and they're reciting them over and over and over again because they were told by their gurus in their churches that if they did this, God would have a deeper relationship with them. They would be able to hear the God that's on the inside of them. So whether it's a meditative entheogen or a chemical one, the outcome is the same. And those who practice meditation and practice psychic sciences and arts and those who get in contact with spiritual healers and aliens and all of this stuff, they do so by the use of chemicals such as cannabis and there's another one I'm going to show you. It's, it's actually in the Bible. And then she describes alpha, light, sleep, dreams, meditation, daydreams, creative visualization, connection to the subconscious. Watch this. What is subconscious? Conscious, the word conscious, the word con means with, okay? Pasta con broccoli, I like it, or pasta con bacon, that's what I like, all right? Con means with. Conscious is related to conscience, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E. that means knowing. Conscious, I, I am alert and I'm knowing everything around me. I am, I am monitoring all of the aspects. I'm hearing, I'm seeing, I'm feeling things, I'm detecting things. That is my conscious. If I want to know what this Bible feels like, I touch it, and I'm consciously aware of what this, and I'm processing that in my mind. That is my conscience. Here's what subconscious is. Picture everything like a, here's an ocean, here's the water. And you look out over the ocean, you can see birds, you can see the sunset, you can see ships going in every now and then, a fish jumping. The fish jumps up, but then it goes down in the water. Does it cease to exist? No, it's still there. It's just that you can't see it or perceive it because it's, there's a barrier here the, of the water. And so sub means under, like a submarine. Sub is under the surface of the water. And there are, there are. God designed this brain to be an amazing piece of equipment. It is, we are processing more from what is around us in our subconscious than we are our conscience. That's why you can be focused on something and looking at something and somebody's talking to you. You're hearing it. It's going into your subconscious, but you're not paying attention to it. So sometimes you go, I'm sorry, what? I, I do that all the time. So, Honey, I did it again. I'm sorry. Can you tell me that again? So I don't, I don't want to forget it, okay? Guys, it's better to ask twice than to pretend you already know it. Trust me. Anyway, when you get the alpha state is when you stop focusing on what's above the water. And you start looking at what's under it. That is alpha state. Cannabis and marijuana will take you from here to here. Does that make sense? Those of you who have done it? Now, let's see what she said. 
Beta is the brain wave that's present for your normal waking state and all the busyness that happens during this state. Most of us are in beta, fully conscious, awake, concentrating throughout the day, but note that you cannot usually receive psychic insights or intuitive guidance in a beta state. That's the state where your conscious mind is fully engaged and operating and everything is busy, busy, busy. You need to be in an alpha state or at least, or at the least, to receive psychic information. Before I begin a reading, I always take myself down to an alpha state through meditation and visualization. I obviously don't call it putting myself in an alpha state, but if I remain in beta with my conscience mind engaged, I can't read for someone. Quite simply, I can't connect with someone's spirit guides in that state. If I tried, I wouldn't get any information. Did you see that? She admitted that in the state that the Bible tells us to be in, you can't talk to these devils. You can't talk to these spirit guides. They're under here. You can't see them, can't have anything to do with them. You have to get under here so you can see them and hear from them and know what they're saying. That's what she's saying. So think about what these drugs do. Think about, number one, what meditation does. Think about what drugs do. Think about what's under the water. Think about Revelation chapter 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Where was he? He was down there. And something happened to where now he's going to come up. But she said, everything that's down here and all those spirits that are down there, you can't talk to them. You can't have anything to do with them as long as you are sober and sober-minded. You see, it doesn't matter if you smoke dope, take um, entheogens, doesn't matter if you, whatever high you're on, or you drink alcohol. One way or the other, one thing or the other will bring you to alpha and below. It's the same thing. So I want you to think about these, um, she, she, the, the idea that the brain operates in frequencies. These frequencies in the Bible are basically waves. And I want you to notice what the Bible says is in these waves. Psalm 93, 3, the floods have lifted up. Oh, Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. Jeremiah 5, 22, fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail, though they roar. Think about something that roars. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. Now, God described the inheritance of Abraham. He described his offspring. And by the way, you and I are of that offspring because we are of faith. We are of the faith of Abraham. So we are children unto Abraham. And God described them as the sand of the sea. And did you notice in Jeremiah 5.22 that here's the sand of the sea, and no matter what the waves do, they cannot pass the sand of the sea. Isn't that beautiful? There is also the idea in your mind and in your conscience. When you are actively thinking and you're in that beta state, I mean, they can kind of whisper to you and beckon you down. They can't tell you anything. I don't recommend being hypnotized, acupunctured, anything like that, where you are... I believe in sleep. Obviously, I do. But I don't recommend having someone tap into your subconscious to bring things out of there. I, I don't recommend it. Maybe I'm wrong. But I would just rather be awake and know what this book said.
Uh, Jeremiah 51, 42, the sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. See, Babylon is under the waves, under the surface. Jeremiah 51, 55, because the Lord has spoiled Babylon and destroyed out of her the great voice, when her waves do roar like great waters, a noise of their voice is uttered. See, that's a, listen to what the newager said. She said these, she's, she described talking to these devils like, turning on the AM radio. And if you're listening to the high frequencies, like around 1400, 1600, you can only listen to those stations. You've got to tune it down to the right waves. So you can hear 550 and 590 and 630 and 10, whatever. Okay? That's the only way that you can listen to them and their voice. You see, the Bible's telling you in these four places, these four verses we looked at, that these waves represent the voice of the ungodly. And they say the only way that you can talk to them and hear from them is to tune in. Remember what Timothy Leary said? Tune in to their waves, to their frequencies, so you can hear what they are saying. In other words, here's the New Age movement. They're saying it this way. This is how God says it, and he's telling you, don't listen to them. Stay awake, and don't listen to them. Don't let your mind go into that drunken, non-sober state. And high, being high, and being on drugs, we talked about this last week, it's, it's called driving under what? The influence of drugs or alcohol. And in the eyes of the law, it doesn't matter. You were in your conscious, rational part of your brain was impaired and you cannot walk, drive, or even see a straight line. Something else has taken over your mind and you're everywhere and you love it. Let's look at a couple more verses. Luke 21, 25. This is New Testament. There should be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves doing what? Roaring. Roar. And he said, Jude chapter 1, verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Who's he talking about here in Jude? The false prophets, the false teachers, the false uh, spirits that are pervading the earth in the last days. He calls them raging waves of the sea. The Bible said, Jesus himself said, the prophecy of the last days, Luke 21, the sea and the waves are going to be what? Roaring like a hungry lion. We know who that is, don't we? Now let's take, take a look at this picture of your brain, all right? This really, this is from an advertisement from Mercedes-Benz. They really, they get it, okay? Your left side of your brain is all binary code and zeros and ones and right and wrong, switches on or off, light and darkness. Everything is very concrete and established. There are no iffy areas. This is either right. It's like your teacher grading your paper. When your teacher grades your paper, she says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, 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 wrong, right, wrong. Okay? Now, that's the rules. She graded your paper, and you got all of these wrong, and you got a few right. But she feels, she feels sorry for you. So now she's going to be creative in how she assigned you the grade. See that? Have you ever had a teacher? I've had a teacher do that. The teacher did not follow the rules in giving me the grade I deserved. He or she let their feelings override that and give me a grade based upon some other reason other than I got it right and wrong. The truth of it is I deserved to fail the test. But what really happened was creativity kicked in. Feelings and emotion kicked in, and I didn't get the grade that I deserved. See how it works? And that's just, that's just one area. But the left side of your brain controlling the right side of your body basically, basically deals with logic, deals, deals with zeros and ones, deals with straight lines, up and down, left and right. But then the right side of your brain 
is all colorful and it's art and music and lyrics and poetry and puffy clouds and everything in the world. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how this looks and how this works in every day. It's, it's everywhere. I'm going to show you this idea. Think of, uh, think of it like this, okay? Think of the left side of your brain being, being um, like the man. Men are more logical. I'm not saying men are smarter than women. Men are just, they see everything black and white, up and down, left and right. This is straight line, this is straight line, and so on and so on. When men put something on the wall, it's got to be in a straight line, and it's full of straight lines, okay, or checkers or whatever. And guys, you don't wear checkers with stripes, okay? We, I mean, we know that, all right? Let's say you have a pair of striped pants, and your wife picks out a shirt for you, and it's got grooves and curves and roundy things in it and all that stuff. Well, that goes with that according to them. And that's not a shirt I would ever pick out. Why? Because my wife perceives what, is, what she likes different than what I like. God created her to be more compassionate, more feeling. More, when, when a son or a daughter needs to rely on stoutness, they go to their dad. When they need to rely upon comfort and love, they go to their mom. I mean, these are just universal things. And this is the way that God made us. He made man and kind. He made them different. So my wife does not pastor the church. She does not teach the doctrine. She does not do that. She does, however, help decorate stuff. And that's one of her jobs here. And she does. I look at it and I'm going, you know what? It looks good. But to ask me to come up with that it's never going to happen. And even if I did it once, my wife would have to come right behind me and say, oh, that doesn't go there. This goes here. And, it, and then you go, oh, well, yeah, it does. Okay. She helps me. She helps me. And sometimes my wife feels things that I don't feel. And in that, she helps me. Sometimes my wife will perceive things that I won't pick up on. And she'll tell me, Something don't feel right about it. Now, should I just automatically just jump and say, oh, my wife doesn't feel good about this. I'm going to do this. No. I'm to take then what she said and I'm apply it to scripture and prayer and see if there is a logical outcome to this. That's how I can make a decision. And this is universal. This is how God made them. But God made the woman to be the weaker vessel. And in the family, the home, it is the husband who is to be the head of the wife, but the wife is to help the husband. That's the way it works. And so in our brain, God designed this in our brain. This side, yes or no. It's yes or no. This side says, now, before you say yes, maybe there's something else. You know, that, that doesn't sound too bad. When I'm reading the scriptures, there's no, when I see, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, years of English language instruction tells me that that's what those symbols mean. They don't mean anything else. They can't mean anything else. It is static, unchangeable, immovable. On or, it's either on or off, open or closed, doesn't matter. But while I'm reading this, and I'm reading, I stood upon the sand of the sea, instantly this side of my brain is drawing a picture of me standing on the sea, on the sand. So having, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Instantly my mind is drawing a picture of a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns. It's there to help. But it's not there to take over. Therein lies the difference. When you are sober, everything is as it's supposed to be. This is in charge. You can walk a straight line. This is helping this. The officer says, can you walk a straight line? Honey, let me show you what a straight line looks like. Yeah, I can do that. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, I'm going to show you this in reality. Now, take a look at this website. Here's what they say about the difference between the alpha state and the beta state. Some research has been done associated with the activities and benefits of other brainwave frequencies such as super beta, gamma, etc. The lower your brainwave CPS, which is cycles per second, the more is your awareness turned toward your subjective experience 
toward your inner world and the more effectively you are able to use the power of your mind to create changes in your body. Let me stop right here. Here's, here's what this is saying. Now, you got to get a hold of this. Remember, remember, this part over here is wanting to take charge over this part over here. And so, according to this, you lower your cycles per second, the brainwave activity. Beta is you're fully alert, you're thinking about everything that's going on, you're reading scripture, you're taking it all in. That's what God has his people do. But then you start lowering the cycles. It starts getting slower and slower, just like a hypnotist talking to you, it starts getting slower and slower until the alpha comes in. And instead of you thinking about, as the Bible says, instead of you walking circumspectly, you are looking around you, you're seeing what's going on in the world, you, you're, you realize that there are dangers out here. And you're looking at the world in a critical fashion. As alpha state takes over, what happens is that you stop looking at what's going on out here and you start looking inward. So think about this. And they mentioned here that uh, once that happens, you're able to make changes in your body. Let's look at it like this. Let's say that uh, the doctor tells you the facts. He's looked through all the, he's done the examinations, done this scan, he's taken this blood test. He looks you in the eye and he says, you have cancer, you have six months to live. Now, the logical part of your brain says, I agree with that, I, I get it, it registers, I have cancer, I'm going to be dead in six months. The creative side, let's, using this scenario, the creative side takes over and tells, tells the guy over here, Go to sleep. Don't worry about it. I'll fix everything. Remember Jezebel and Ahab. A Jezebel told Ahab, Ahab, go lay down, suck your thumb, do whatever you're going to do. I'll get the vineyard for you. So the creative part of your mind, the intuitive, the feeling part, the one that has all the creative energies to it, basically tells this side, go to sleep. I'm going to imagine a scenario in a world whereby you are not going to surely die. I'm going to fix it to where you're going to live forever, but you need to let me imagine it. And that's what they're telling you here. They're telling you that once you're in alpha state, and then you, you can move down from there, that now your mind has the ability to create um, changes in the world around you. <laughs> that sounds a lot like... Joel and Joyce, Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, okay? She's going to tell you, you're going to create your own world. If the doctor tells you you have sickness, you just proclaim, I'm imagining right now me without sickness. Hallelujah. Then it's going to happen because I said the words and I imagined it in my head. Jesus told us about our thoughts. The, the Old Testament tells us that God knoweth the thoughts of man. They're vanity. God, God knows the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. That's what God knows about us. Jesus himself said, which one of you can just by thinking change your body by adding a cubit to your stature? You can't do it. But there is a deception here that wants you to think that you can. So we bring out A Course in Miracles. The Course in Miracles basically is all about meditation, getting your mind down to the alpha state and so on, so you can hear something on the inside of you, and that is your creative God, and it's going to do this, and it's going to heal you, and it's going to do all kinds of stuff, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's what that's talking about. Um, uh, the, use the power of your mind to create changes in your body. Joel Osteen's wrote on this, Joyce Myers has written on this, and countless other Church gurus are trying to tell you that Christianity really is nothing more than a self-help technique. That is not true. That's not true. The Bible is not a self-help manual. It is a God-help manual. That's what it is. You can't do it on your own. You have to have God. But anyway, watch this. With each lower state, you become more fully aligned with the source of power 
within you, with your unconscious, or if you prefer, with that part of you that is greater than you. Let me stop right here. I'm explaining this one piece at a time so you get it, all right? The idea is with each lower state, you become full, more fully aligned with the source of the power within you. Remember the entheogens. Remember the chemicals, the drugs that the medicine men and the witch doctors would either swallow or smoke, and that turned them inward to see the God that was inside of them. It mentions the source. The source is a Kabbalah term. The source is basically in the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, which is what Paul dealt with back in the book of Galatians. It was witchcraft, and he knew it. The Kabbalah says that there is that man in every, the universe was created by the source. And the source is in you and wants you and the source to join together. Remember Neo in the Matrix, all right? He, wanted, he had to go to the source, which is the architect. So that's what that's talking about. And your, your subconscious is everything that's underneath the surface level, everything that's under the water, down in the deep, all right? So, generally, in beta state, your attention is focused outward. In alpha, it begins to turn inward. That's what marijuana does. And in theta and delta, it goes further and further inward. The deeper you go, the more effectively you are able to enter your subconscious. You can imagine that at the borderline between beta and alpha states, are you ready for this? Is a doorway to your subconscious mind and the doorway consists of what is referred to in hypnosis as your critical faculty. Here we go. Now we have a doorway. We have a doorway between the conscience and the subconscious. We have a doorway that is shut by what the Bible calls sobriety. We're going to learn about that next week. What the Bible calls being sober-minded. And there's a door that, that keeps our mind right with God. But that doorway can get open by drunkenness, by meditation, by using drugs or whatever. What's behind door number one? That's what you don't want to find out. But the powers that be want you to open that doorway between your conscious awareness and all the little goodies that's in on your subconscious. And the only way to do that are you ready for this? The only way for your, this part of your brain, the creative intuitive part, to control this part of your brain that has the strength in it, it is the one that's in charge. The only way to do that is to put this part asleep. Think of it like this. When drunkards get good and drunk, what do they do? They sleep. Paul mentioned that in 1 Thessalonians 5. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken when? In the night. Drunkenness brings on sleep. What do they do before, and this is one of the legitimate uses of mind-altering drugs. What do they do to someone before they go into surgery? They, in essence, they get them drunk. You remember the old westerns? All right. And the guy had the arrow sticking out of his back. And so his buddies were going to help him, so they bring out a bottle of whiskey, and they pour it down him real good and get him good and drunk. And then they pour it you know, around there so the alcohol can clean the wound and all that stuff. Then they pull the arrow out. And it's not as bad because he's drunk. When people go into surgery, what do we do? We make, this, we make all these guys go to sleep. The whole brain goes to sleep, so now they can operate on you, and you won't know anything about it. So the, this part here, the woman, the female, the weaker, has to put this guy here over to sleep. There is, a, there, there is a picture of this inside of your King James Bible where there are some enemies waiting to be released. And the woman caused the man to be conquered by putting him to sleep. Judges chapter 16 verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath shewed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, 
and brought money in their hand, because she likes money, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Did you see that? She, remember, the, the strength of Samson was the seven locks. What are those seven locks? The seven spirits of God. Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. That's what those seven locks represent, perfection and completion. That's where his power comes from, comes from here. But what did she do? She made him go to sleep. And while he was asleep, they cut off his locks and took his power away from him. So now the Philistines can conquer him and lord over him. I'm telling you, that is exactly what's going on in this world. The power of God in people's lives, and especially church people, is being shaved off because people in mass, in the mass, or mass quantities of people, are doing exactly things like this in the church. We're going to get into that uh, probably next week. But the idea is that she, the, the, the creative part, the intuition part, the harlot part that takes money, made him go to sleep so they could take over. That's, exa that's, what, that's what cannabis does. That's what acid does, LSD. That's what all of these drugs have a tendency to do, is to put this to sleep. So this, I mean, you remember back in the 70s, people were tripping out everywhere. There would be some guy standing on top of a 50-story building saying, I can fly, I can fly. And he did for, you know, 49 stories. But she took over and he imagined that he could do things that the laws of physics and gravity and the whole universe says he cannot do. So I'm going to show you, I'm, here, I'm going to make this real simple. I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen and I'm going to show you the difference between, uh, between when, where the woman is in charge, the weaker part, Mystery Babylon, this side of your brain, the creative part, uh, versus where the logical part is. Everything has an order to it. Everything is recognizable and so on. I'm going to illustrate that for you, all right? So I'm going to put a picture up on the screen, and I want you to take a look and ask yourself the question. I'm going to show you a field. Can you discern which field man seated and sowed? Which field the woman seated and sowed? I'm going to show it to you. Here's what it looks like. Take a look at it. Can you tell which field the man sowed, the logical part of him sowed? Sure, the one with straight rows and lines, and it's in a square, and it, that, I mean, it's perfect. Everything has to be in order. That is this part of your brain. The farmer who plowed this had the ability to put a straight line in his brain and drive his tractor in a straight line so it put it all in nice neat rows and so when it comes harvest time they're all right there in a nice row we don't have to go here and to go there and do this and do that it's all right there but then you take a field that man has not touched I mean take a look at it again Oh, you've got this color here and this color here kind of mixed in with that color. You've got this kind of grass and that kind of grass and you've got trees. The trees aren't in a row. The grass isn't in a row. Nature created it all. Oh, let's put this here. Oh, let's put this here. Let's do this. Let's, let's be colorful with it. Let's just kind of expand everything. That's the difference between what the logical does and what the creative does. Now, as far as God's world is concerned, I look at both these pictures, and they're beautiful. They are absolutely beautiful. One is beautiful in its order and structure. The other is beautiful in that it's not necessarily ordered and structured. Structured, But remember, beside the aesthetic value of looking out over a field, does the fact that the field is pretty put food in your belly? No. Because imagine if you had a garden and you, took, you were going to plant, I don't know, six or seven different things out in that garden and you mixed all the seeds together into a nice little seed salad. You went out there, you tilled the ground up and you just took handfuls of seed and began to throw it everywhere. Covered it up with some hay, some dung or whatever. 
And, you know, in about two and a half, three months, you're out there, well, picking a tomato here. Oh, there's some okra right here. here look, there's some beans down here. Aside from it being pretty, it's impractical. And if we're going to get any benefit other than eye candy, it has to be logical. It has to be in a row. That's, that's how it's done in farming. That's how it's done in baseball. That's how it was always done in the church. God said to the Apostle Paul who wrote it down, let, and, and he said this in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. He said it in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 because that's the tongues chapter. And he said, if any man, he gave a rule. He said, if any man speaking in the tongue, let it be by two or at the, uh, at the most three, and that by course. First this one, then this one, and then this one, and then let one interpret. Did you see that? It's in order. That's God's way. If I ever, and you know, maybe you probably know my stand on tongues. I think they were human languages, according to the scriptures. But if I ever went into a Pentecostal church and I heard someone speak in a tongue, then another one stood and spoke in a tongue, and then a third one maybe, and then one stood up and interpret, I would say, you know what? I don't really agree with this, but they're following the scriptures. That's what I believe. They're following the order of God. But that's not what you see in a lot of them, is it? You go into them, what do you hear? What do you see? Oh, praise God, it's pandemonium. We got people flying everywhere. There's all sorts of tongues being all talked at once. Hallelujah, this is of God. No, it's not. No, it's not. It does not follow the order that's in the scriptures. The order and the scriptures have been made to go to sleep. And now the feminine creative side is taking over, the feeling side. Oh, I got a feeling coming on me. Woo! That's her. That's how you recognize her. She's always chaotic. She's always out of course. Always. So, you're going to go, somebody invited you to a church. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll go to your church. Where is it? What's it called? It's called Imagine Church. I mean, here's their graphic here. And see, they use the same illustration that I did. A field and plants everywhere and all. Oh, it's pretty. But this is the Imagine Church. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to go into Alpha State because of the music is making us do that. And now we're in Alpha. And now we're intuiting God's voice. Now we can hear it on the inside of us. That is exactly what's going on in a lot of these churches, people. Let me, let me show you another example of the difference between order and chaos. Or this part of the brain, the logical versus this side. Let me show you another picture of it. This is art. One side, you see ships and the ship's mast and the flags and the buildings, and the sea, and the shore, and people standing there, and trees. I mean, you, see, you recognize it. And then here's another picture with ships, and a building, and the sky, and the seas, and people. It's my picture. I can make it whatever I want to. You see what I did? Now, this picture here on the right, what does it look like? Uh, just colors and wavy lines. And, but I could go up to it in, in the museum and go, that is an amazing picture of buildings and a ship and people standing there and I see an ocean and then this is that. I could say that and somebody else could come upon me saying, oh, she's lovely. The woman that's in this painting is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I just love her. It's all subjective. It's what, whatever someone feels like doing. Think about what God, what you hear all through the Old Testament, and everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Let's create a new paradigm whereby people can be sodomites, perpetual sodomites, and still go to heaven. That's an imagining, that's intuiting, that is being creative with Christianity rather than following the rules. And that kind of stuff is happening everywhere. Now I'm going to show you in the lyrics of a song. And I'm, we're going we're gonna to wind down with this part here. Then we're going to get into next week. I'm going to show you from the scriptures why 
marijuana, cannabis, peyote, LSD, heroin, cocaine, Jack Daniels. I'm going to show you the harm that these things are doing. These things hold power over people. Now I'll show you that next week. Now I'm going to put the lyrics up to two songs, all right? Um, you're going to recognize which one was written by the logical side of the brain in the beta state. Then you're going to see another one and you're going to recognize that it was written probably in an alpha state or lower, probably in an alpha state. Look at it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Now I'm going to stop right here. You can easily understand those words, can't you? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And even at this, watch this now. This is, this is how it works so perfectly. Even at this, you can see the creativity and the poetry in it. That comes from here. She's helping him. So we take doctrine and we put it in an artistic fashion. Nothing wrong with that. Because she is helping him. So we have rhythm. We have rhyming. When we sing it, we have melody. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And then we could add some bass and some alto and some soprano in there and make it sound wonderful. That is both sides of the brain working together. But the logic is the one in charge. The melody is what's in charge. When you look at the lyrics of this song, you don't always first thing go to the harmony part of Amazing Grace. The first thing comes up in your mind is the melody. Amazing Grace. Now look at the other song. Man, you've been a naughty boy. You let your face grow long. I am the egg man. They are the egg men. I am the walrus. Goo, 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 jube. Now, you might recognize this is a Beatles song, John Lennon, I Am the Walrus. Where's the sense in it? There ain't none. Doesn't make sense. It, I don't understand the lyrics. What does goo 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 jube mean? What is the egg men? I am the egg man. You are the egg men. I don't, I don't get that. Well, you know, what this means is this. No, somebody else says, no, what it, what it really means is this. Oh, you don't know John Lennon. John Lennon thought it meant this. And it's subject. Whatever you want to think it means, that's what it means. And if you happen to be taking the same drug that John Lennon took probably when he wrote this, then you probably might even see the same way that he saw it when he wrote it. But none of this makes sense. None of it does. It's all way out there, willy-nilly, and you can make it whatever you want to. So look at this. Look at this. Just apply this principle in our society, in our country right now. Our country is supposed to be governed by a document, the Constitution, and the subsequent laws that have been handed down to the citizens of the United States for the past 200 some odd years that are supposed to be based upon the written rules that our forefathers laid down. It's true in any country, in any country. The country, if they follow the rules that they agreed to that are written down in a law book somewhere, that is the man or the logic part of this side being in charge. Would you want to live in a society where everybody just made up their own laws? Would you want to live that way? Doesn't it make you mad? When a judge will take someone who has committed some crime somewhere, some bad crime, and he lets his passions out and he feels sorry for the guy, so I'm only going to give you probation. See, you know, let's say he raped a woman, molested a child or something like that. I'm only going to, I'm going to give you probation because I think you're a really good guy. That's kind of what I think. And so I'm going to feel sorry for you. That's the creative part. She doesn't belong on the bench. The judge says what you did was wrong, 
We're going to follow the rules. The law says five years in prison, 10 years in prison, 15, the rest of your life. The law says execution. That's what we're going to do. You have put that in any realm of life. The logical, yes and no, in and out, up and down, left and right, on and off, part of our brain, part of any society, anything in the world, it has to be that way, including the church. But what happens? With the introduction of new age techniques in every aspect of life. Remember, when Marilyn Ferguson wrote The Aquarian Conspiracy, she basically said, we're everywhere. We are in the government, we're in the, we're in the school systems, we're in the colleges, we're in businesses. We're behind pulpits. And we're trying to get people to intuit or imagine their God rather than, ah, it's God, follow the rules in the Bible. When you hear these, when you hear these guys going, oh, you fundamentalists, you've got God in a box. Let him out. They, their idea of, that God is, is bound up, he's being held prisoner, and we need to let him run free. That's being brought into the church by way of meditation. What is taking over our society in general in this country with the legalization of more and more drugs? We're going to turn from a nation who sees everything as right and wrong to a nation of do whatever you want to. Oh, you two men are in love. You should get married. That's what we're turning into. One has an effect on the other. Let me say this, and then we'll close out. Let's say that you know 20 people. Let's outside of a Bible-believing church. You know 20 people outside of a Bible-believing church, all right? Or they're, they're not Christians. Out of those 20, how many of those do you really think probably at some point in their life have said or are saying now, ah, if these guys want to marry, let them, go. Let, them do, let them live their own way. You probably know quite a few that way. Whereas in this country, 40, 50 years ago, in the era of, let's say, World War II, the Korean War, that was never even thought of. In fact, if you were found out to be a sodomite in some towns, you didn't live very long. I'm not saying that's right either. I'm just saying that the mentality of a vast majority of Americans was against that kind of wickedness. Not anymore. Because we've been taking drugs for the last 40 years. Now we think differently, don't we? And so next week, I'm going to show you the religion of drugs, the religion of drunkenness. So be ready for that one, all right? Let me leave you with this verse. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be awake. For your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. So have your mind right. Put away the drugs, the chemicals, the whiskey, everything like that. Put away all of this stuff and have a sober mind about what's going on in these days. God will bless you. God will give you this word. All right, this is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.